Good evening and welcome to Night Colors Bigfoot Radio. You are here with your hostess, Lauren Smith. And tonight we are going to be interviewing Shane Corson. But before we get into it, I wanted to ask that you please show some love for the hardworking Night Colors team by hitting the thumbs up on whatever platform you're using to listen to the show. And don't forget to subscribe and ring that notification bell for new content that I release every single week. And if you'd like to check out all of the things that I do and all of the content I produce, go to nightcollarsproductions.com and you can find all the things that I work so hard on to bring to you guys. And you can also contact me through that website if you want, if you have suggestions for a show or a night terrors or any of the other projects that I do. So I'm not going to keep you too long. I really want to go ahead and get to our guest. So I'm going to go ahead and bring on Mr. Shane Corson. How are you doing tonight, Shane? I'm doing great, Lauren. Thanks for having me on. I'm a big fan of the show, so uh, appreciate it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, so you have your own show, correct? I do. Monster X Radio. been running it since about uh, the beginning of 2013, and it's a passion of love. <laughs> so... So who do you, who's your, who are your co-hosts with that? I mean, I know, but I want my listeners to know. <laughs> yeah. Gunnar Monson is uh, one of my original co-hosts and he d also owns the company Sasquatch Coffee yes. and Thomas Seawood, who's uh, a native American okay. and he's, um, he does uh, Sasquatch Island for the podcast and it's all Bigfoot related period. So that's all we do. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. I, uh, I've actually been in talks with Gunner about, I, I told him, I said, you know, I do two things in my life that I'm extremely passionate about and that would be coffee and Bigfoot. So what, what can we do to work out a deal here? <laughs> so, right. Yeah. The best combinations. Best combination. And so I said, you know, I'll, I'll rep your stuff. I mean, hook me up, sponsor me. And so he said, we'll talk. <laughs> 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 yeah, that was, Good. you know, I'll take it. <laughs> um, okay. So you, you know, you're part of the Olympic project and you're part of project zoo book, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, huge, uh, part of, uh, of the Olympic project. And I've been very blessed and lucky to be a part of product zoo book, uh, which is just a great group of individuals. And so, um, I'm constantly busy working with the two organizations. Awesome. That's awesome. Um, so I guess we'll just go ahead and get started. How did you get started in this topic? Yeah, so I was born and raised in Scotland. I lived on an island off the west coast of Scotland called Isla. And if anybody's a Scotch fan, a whiskey fan, they'll know many of the names uh, from that island, like Book Haven, Port Ellen, Port Charlotte, uh, Lafroy, Glagavolin. And so, I mean, it's it's known for its its whiskey on the you know from that island, very small island. But I grew up there. Um, I was heavily in, interested in paleontology, the study of you know dinosaurs and, and mm -hmm. megafauna and that sort of thing. My mom really got me interested in cryptids. Uh, you know, whether it was the Yeti, Bigfoot, Mokla Membi, uh, all these lake monsters. And uh, so I just started really researching all cryptids in general, but I was really passionate about Sasquatch, even in Scotland. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, I've never been to the States, but between the Patterson Gimlin film and all the documentaries I could get my hands on, even though TV where I grew up was actually hard to watch because we didn't get great TV reception. It was very <laughs> difficult. Yeah. Um, but any book I get my hands on, you know, in the island I lived on, we didn't really have a big library. Uh, I had to go to the mainland, which would have been Glasgow or Edinburgh. And um, so any books I get my hands on. And between that and paleontology, I used to write certain uh, academic individuals, paleontologists that were in Scotland, write them letters way before, you know, the Internet was around. And they would write me letters back. And it really Aww. encouraged me to pursue dinosaurs and, and mysteries in general. Okay. Um, and then, uh, in 93, we moved to the States. We moved to San Diego, East County, San Diego, Ramona. And, um, you know, I was still really interested in the topic and thought, well, now I'm in the States. I want to really investigate the Sasquatch phenomena. Mm -hmm. 97 came around, you know, I, I graduated high school and I got my wheels and was driving around and I started doing investigations all around Southern California, all around Northern California, and, you know, from the San Bernardino's to, uh, you know, Lake Cuyamaca, the Alpine area where the Zubies are from, all the way up to Yosemite. And I just was investigating what I thought was investigating at the time. We can talk about that later. But I, I was investigating <laughs> reports, right. looking for uh, data, looking for things. And um, I really, over those years, the only thing, you know, uh, 97 through 2006, before I moved to Oregon, 
I really didn't come across too many interesting finds for myself, but I did interview a ton of really interesting people that had encounters in California and some individuals from out of the state. But uh, that's, you know, that's kind of my background and what got me interested in the topic matter. Right. So when did you when did you find yourself immersed in kind of the Bigfoot community? Oh, man. So. Or when did uh, you link up with other researchers, I guess would be. My yeah. Question. Yeah. Well, I had. So 2000, I moved up to Oregon in 2008 and I thought I'm in the Mecca. I, you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> two hours away from good areas or an hour away from great areas living just outside of Portland. I could hit the coast. I could hit the mountains. Um, mm-hmm. 2011, after many years of Bigfoot research or what I thought was research at the time, I was on a backpacking trip out in the mountains uh, with some friends from a remote area just fishing because I'm an avid fisherman, yeah. not doing anything Bigfoot related. And I had an encounter, a two night encounter that rocked my world. It solidified that Sasquatch existed. And so from there, uh, for a couple of months, I thought I could prove it. You know, I've seen this thing. I know where it's at and no, no I could not, but so that, no. that <laughs> exactly <laughs> what that did for me was, okay, uh, I'm a, I'm a basically even from 2008 to 2011, I'm a transplant here in the Pacific Northwest. I need right. to start reaching out and seeing if there's anybody out there that could help me or I can join up with. And fortunately, um, 2000, well, the tail end of 2011 and 12, I met people like Cliff Berrickman, mm-hmm. uh, Derek Randall's of the Olympic Project. And so I started immersing myself with these guys, learning what they knew, becoming friends with them. And I got to be great friends with Cliff Berrickman. Uh, and then I eventually, you know, like I said, met Derek Randall's and became a part of the Olympic Project in 2012, 2013. And um, that's when I realized that what I consider to be research was not quite up to par. I had a lot to learn. And since then, um, I've gone, you know, head deep into, I mean, I've just dived into it and it's been a wild and fun ride. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I usually save this question for later in the show, but I think it kind of fits in right now. So how has your research changed from when you started to now, but not just your research, how has your mindset changed? Oh, great question. So, you know, a lot of people get into this field thinking, and and myself included, that you just go out and you do a little camping, a little hiking, and you look for stuff and that's all you do. And you you listen, you look. Um, It's really become important to me. And what I've learned over the years is the amount of data it's, it's the data collection for me that's really opened my eyes up because with data collection, you know, whether it's Sasquatch or not, if you're studying a certain area or a certain uh, region, if you're collecting data, whether, like I said, there's a Sasquatch report or not, you're learning about that environment. So it's all about data collection for me now. And that's what the Olympic Project, Derek Randall's, uh, David Ellis, uh, and many others, Cindy Dose, and many others have taught me is that the collection of data and compiling that data and being adamant and doing your due diligence on collecting that data. And what that does for you is it paints a picture. Okay. Is Sasquatch right. here at a certain time of year? Is it not? Is there any Sasquatch in this area? What are the known animals? What are the known animals noises they're making? What could they eat? Uh, yes. What is the weather patterns? All that stuff. So my research is, I mean, completely flipped around. Yes. I'm out in the field looking for impressions, looking for all of that stuff, uh, collecting audio, But the data collection is key. It's absolutely key. And it's key to stay in one area for a lengthy period of time, you know, instead of the ambulance chasing. Here's an encounter. Here's an encounter. Here's a report. Here's that stuff has value. Don't get me wrong. Right. But yeah, the longer you're in one area, you learn all the fauna in that area. You learn what plants are growing, what animals eat those plants, what the weather patterns are. And and then you can ask questions. Why would a Sasquatch be here? You know, Mm -hmm. whether year round or periodically. And so that's really key, I think. And that's where my research has gone is not necessarily to prove Sasquatch exists. Uh, the majority of the Olympic Project pretty much know they exist. Uh, not everybody, but quite a few of them. But we're really about collecting data in trying to look at this phenomenon from a scientific approach as much as we can, though we do have academic individuals in our group. Mm-hmm. Not all of us have that background, but we are about as well versed in this topic matter. And, you know, many of us are, uh, you know, hunters, fishermen hikers, mm-hmm. uh, trackers, you name it. And it's just about, it's a learning curve. It's a learning process. And right. so it, that's, that's what it's all about. And that's how the research for me has progressed 
And mm-hmm. it's been such a, an awesome thing because I've learned so much about the environment and it's made me really appreciate the areas I traverse in. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think you do have to learn from the ground up. Um, I mean, I've, I've been doing this for a long time and I've seen, um, you know, people that go investigate uh, witness encounters and those are very important. You know, those give us the whole reason we do this is because of witness encounters. That's the, the reason, you know, that we can do this and that we know to research. So I think there's definitely two sides to it. There's the people that go get the witness encounters and then there's people like you guys who are, you know, getting the framework for when these things are proven to exist, you guys then turn your efforts to conservation and, you know, kind of keeping these things safe and, and, you know, stuff like that. So. Yeah. Great. So, that's a great point. Yeah. Um, okay. So I just want to make sure there are no questions from the chat. If you guys have a question, be sure to put it in caps and my moderators will get those to me. Hi, Lori. Okay. So uh, where all have you researched besides the Pacific Northwest? <clears throat> Honestly, just so um, West coast, I, I I've done a little okay. bit, um, you know, when I travel and I'm invited out to areas or I ask certain researchers, like years ago, I was out in Kentucky and I reached out to Charlie Raymond. I said, Hey, Charlie, you know, and he's a great guy, great, you know, researcher. I said, mm-hmm. where's a good spot to go to? And he sent me to a location. I had a couple of nights free, but mainly the West coast, uh, mainly all, you know, California from top to bottom, uh, okay. Oregon and Washington. Those are the three locations. You know, I spent many years in Oregon, many years in California. And, and now I moved up to Washington in 2017. And uh, right now with my research uh, involved with the Olympic project and the Olympics in general, I don't see myself going anywhere. We got, we do have a lot of stuff going on out here and uh, we're, we're adamant about just staying in one location, one general region and researching that area till it, we bleed it dry, which I don't see happening anytime soon. (laughs) Right. Right. No, I understand. I think that's awesome that you guys have that and that you can do that. Um, I'll actually be going to Washington for the first time next month and, and Oregon and California. And I am so excited to go oh, to Bigfoot wow. Mecca. I yeah. am stoked. So, um, where yeah, about I, you going? I got to ask you, where about you going in the, in, I'm I mean, going without, to the yeah. no, that's okay. I'm going to the Medellin Falls, uh, conference, the Bigfoot. I'll conference. be there. I'm speaking. Yes. Oh, awesome. Good. I'll yeah, get I'm to meet speaking. you. Yeah. Awesome. And, um, from there, we're just, we're going to go down to Grant's pass and then just down, you know, all the way to the redwoods and everything and just kind of take a trip back to Oklahoma. So I'm really excited. Um, I don't think I'm going to get to go to bluff Creek like I planned. So, but I'm, I'm still, I'm stoked, you know, so I get to, I don't know um, how much research I'll be able to do, but you can guarantee if we're stopped, I'm going to be out in the woods. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I understand. Yeah. If you had more time, I'd say, Hey, let's meet up and I'll, I'll take you out here. Some, some uh, beautiful areas, but I know you're yeah. probably on a crunch for time. Yeah. We've kind of got everything scheduled. So, you know, I'd have to look at it, but yeah, I, I would appreciate that if, if possible for sure. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm so excited. I can't wait to see, you know, all of all that area and kind of because I I see it on TV and I hear all the Bigfoot reports, but to get to go up there and kind of see what, where the, what the geography is like for the Bigfoot up there, you know, kind of, I don't want to say face to the name, but land to the encounters that I've heard. <laughs> Good for you. Sense. You're going to have yeah, a blast. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm so excited. So um, can you tell me about any experiences that you've had? Well, I'll get into, you know, briefly um, my original encounter in 2011. Like I said, I was out in the Mount Hood National Forest mm-hmm. uh, on a backpacking trip, a, you know, high mountain lake fishing trip and w- wasn't uh, an area that I've never been in uh, this particular area. I've never been in, but I had two buddies that really wanted to go co-workers that were avid fishermen like myself and they really wanted to get out and do something and do some fishing. Uh, both of them not really into Sasquatch. One of them, his girlfriend had a sighting a couple of years back and he was interested in the phenomena. And then another friend mm-hmm. from Boston who had really no experience in the woods. And so we picked out a spot to hike into and built our camp up, uh, this high mountain lake in the Mount Hood national forest. And, uh, we went to go find a couple other lakes, got lost. We ended up hiking like 17 miles that day, trying to find another lake because we yeah. took the completely wrong path. We end up on this ridge line. We're seeing bear sign. Uh, my buddy from Boston was definitely afraid of bears. He's never seen one. 
I'm familiar with Barris Hill was my buddy Mitch, and uh, we didn't have any issues with that. But he 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 had uh, high disdain for Bears. <laughs> so uh, and and I'm uh, literally ta- telling you, this guy would be uh, behind us where as we're lost and hiking off trail, banging pots. He was that guy. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. Um, he didn't have a weapon at the time. Uh, we all carry weapons more in the woods, regardless, because there's a lot of a lot of dangerous stuff out there. So right. um, we we eventually find our, the trail, hit the lake we're supposed to hit. But by that time, it's getting, you know, it's it's getting dark and we have to make it back to camp. We have a couple mile hike back to camp. We hike back to camp, build a fire, cook our food, stay up till about 11, 1130 and go to bed, go to our tents, three separate tents along along this lake. And above this lake or where we we're camping was a little bit of a hilltop. So we we're kind of lower in kind of in a little bit of a bowl. Well, 1.32 in the morning, I'm hearing what sounds like rock clanking. It just, you know, we wake up and it just sounds like two rocks being smashed together. Uh, Ian, Bostonian, was snoring away. My buddy Mitch is next to me. And he's closest to this lake. And we're kind of in a pyramid formation as far as tents are concerned. And my buddy Mitch whispers, are you awake? And I said, yes. And he said, do you hear that? I said, yeah, I hear that. Uh, what is it? And I said, I don't know. It sounds like two rocks being smashed together. And um, we're listening to this thing and it gets closer and closer. And then I hear what sounds like a percussive or a wood knock. Mm-hmm. And I hear stomping around. And then I hear this thing t- you know, peel off and I hear the, the, the clanking again. And it's getting more distant and distant. And this probably lasted five to 10 minutes. I honestly don't know. Cause I was a little freaked out and I was trying to, in my head, trying to figure out what this was at, you know, one thirty-two right. in the morning in the middle, you know, middle of nowhere. Uh, there's no other campers around. There's nothing. We're not at a camp ground. We're out on a high mountain Lake. Right. And so I'm thinking in my head, well, could it have been elk, you know, antlers, deer, you know, and this is August. So I'm thinking about all the known animals to be doing this stuff and people, no flashlights. We didn't see any right. lights. Right. Well, it, it stopped and it moved away and that was it. So next morning we wake up, we kind of briefly talk about it. Uh, my buddy Ian didn't hear any of this. And so we, uh, we, you know, we're on a fishing trip and we're we, now that we know our way around this area without getting lost, we go and hit some of the other lakes we're going to fish. There's about six to seven or five to seven lakes in this area, roughly. And so we, we hiked a mile or two miles, you know, from lake to lake to lake and mm-hmm. fished our brains out. Lots of brookies, lots of, uh, cutthroats and some other species of fish in these areas. And so we make it back to camp that evening and we're going to be out there for three nights. So we're on our second night. Mm-hmm. We make it back to camp, same sort of MO. We build a fire. We, we cook our food. We um, just chat for a while and we go to bed about 11, 1130 with right. the idea of hitting some of the lakes we've not fished yet. And my buddy Ian builds this humongous fire up because he was a little freaked out. You know, between the bear sign and what we were talking about, he right. builds this humongous fire. And I'm like, well, you need, you know, calm down. I don't want you to start a forest fire out here. August <laughs> can be kind of dry in these areas. So let's, you yeah. know, even though everything's still wet, something could catch. Better so, safe than sorry. Yeah, exactly. So he builds this big fire up and we go to bed. <laughs> and um, that night previously, because he was so worried, I gave him a, a, a weapon. I gave him a nine millimeter, which in the woods is not much. <laughs> but, but I gave him, I I, yeah, and, and he knew how to operate a weapon, but uh, I just wanted him to feel comfortable. I had an extra weapon. And so I gave it to him. And as we're laying there in our tents, about 1.32 in the morning, we're all out, Ian snoring away. I hear that rock clanking start again, 1.32 in the morning. And it's coming, it's getting closer from a distance, you know, maybe 7,500 yards away, I'm hearing it. And it's getting closer and closer. Mm-hmm. My buddy Mitch, once again, to the left of me, closest to the lake, goes, hey, do you hear that? I said, yeah. He said, it's back. I said, I know. What do you think it is? I don't know. And as we're listening, it gets closer and closer and it stops. And we're listening. And all of a sudden, we start hearing what sounds like something very heavy moving through the woods above us around our camp. And he's hearing something to the left of him. And I'm hearing something to the right of me. And I'm thinking, well, and we're whispering this back and forth. So I'm thinking there must be two of whatever the heck's going on out here. And at this point, I, I start thinking, you got to be kidding me. Could this be Sasquatch? You know, it did enter my brain. I get asked that question. Yeah. It did enter my brain. But I'm, you know, I'm still trying to rationalize this. I, I haven't done anything Bigfoot. I didn't do any calls. You know, the, the nearest thing I think we did was chop firewood, which could sound like a wood knock. Right. Um, but or just I'm being hearing, there. Or just being there. Exactly. Yeah. And so we're, 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 we're hearing this thing move around us and then silence again and as we're laying in our tents you know Ian's still asleep Mitch is awake I'm awake and we're just listening I hear 
or we heard five five knocks in a row, and it was powerful knocks, percussive sounds on a tree, so much to the fact you could you could feel them vibrate underneath your tent. So it was close. Uh, up there in the Mount Hood National Forest, and some of the many of the forests up here in the Pacific Northwest, based on the soil content and the root structures, like you could hear something coming down the trail, just the vibration because it's kind of mm-hmm. hollow. And so these knocks were powerful. I mean, just powerful. And I mean, five in a row and to the point where it, it shook me. I was like, holy smokes, that is something that is power. Right. And it echoed. It just echoed. And Mitch and I are sitting there listening to this. Ian wakes up finally because you couldn't sleep. This was so loud and profound. <laughs> he wakes up and he goes, what the hell is that? You know, this, that. And after those knocks stopped, we're listening and he's whispering away like, what is that? I said, shut up, shut up, shut up. And you hear something coming through the trees right above our camp hitting the tree branches and we're we're talking about really tall the spur trees we're in you right. know a forest and then thud lands next to my buddy mitch's tent and i knew what it was automatically and he did too and mitch goes something just threw a rock at us because you hear it hit the mud next to his tent yeah. and i mean hitting the tree branches and thud and instantly i thought okay we're either dealing with some crazy human or we're dealing with a sound squatch i mean what else throws a rock mm-hmm. in the woods yeah you know and so we're hearing that, and then the crunches of branches start happening again. Something's just storming around. I mean, now it sounds like an elephant. No, I never heard a vocal. I never smelt anything. Uh, and maybe that's because at that time, my heart was in my head. I mean, literally, I could hear the yeah. blood pressure just bump, yeah. bump. Adrenaline um, was, is high. <laughs> it was high, and I was freaked out. I almost felt paralyzed at one point, and then I right. talked myself out of it because I thought, well, this thing's back second night. It hasn't rushed camp. It hasn't hurt us. So... I physically walked myself out of feeling paralyzed. I did in my mm-hmm. tent, you know, and I think that's where a lot of people get in, And I'm not speaking for everybody, but I think a lot of times right. people don't understand what adrenaline and fear can do to you. It can yeah. paralyze you. You could feel what they call zapped. Yeah. Um, and that's how I felt, but I wasn't, I walked myself out of it. Uh, and I thought, okay, I got to be responsible here. I don't know what's going to happen next. And fortunately nothing happened. It stormed around our camp or they stormed around our camp or it, whatever. And, um, um, uh, backtrack a little bit to to why I know Sasquatch exists. So um, after that tree came down, um, or excuse me, after that uh, knocking and and went on the storming around the camp, my buddy Ian was just freaking out. He's freaking out big time. Mm-hmm. And I thought he was going to shoot somebody because I could hear him messing with the gun. I said, Ian, put the gun oh, down. No. <laughs> yeah. And I'm in my head, I'm thinking, you idiot. You idiot. You yeah. gave somebody a gun. Um and that was that was stupid on my part. I admit that. I know mm-hmm. that. But uh, he was freaking out. So I thought to myself, you know, I need to get that gun from him. I need to calm him down. But I really didn't want to get out of my tent. I really did not want to get out of my tent. But I knew I had to. So I un- started unzipping my tent. And I'm peering around this little slit in my tent. And I'm looking around, looking around. And I, out of the corner of my eye, I see some movement behind a tree. And I focus in on it. And what I see is this figure, I see a, a, a hand, an arm, a shoulder, and a head, and it's just rocking back and forth behind this tree, back creepy. and forth. And it, it was creepy, and it looked massive. Yeah. And I got my eyes fixated on it, and I'm just staring at it, and it takes its hand off, drops its side, it turns around, peels away, and moves down this uh, little game trail and away. And that was it. Um, I never did get out of my tent. Uh, Ian and everybody went quiet. And I just sat there till daybreak. Uh, a couple hours later, you know, five in the morning, I think the, when the daylight came up. Mm-hmm. And collectively, we we broke our camp and just left. We didn't stick around. <laughs> Every, everybody was freaked out of their mind. Yeah. Um, I didn't talk about that with them. You know, the whole ride home, we were kind of quiet about it. And mm-hmm. it was just one of those things where... We all knew we experienced something crazy, but nobody really wanted to talk about it. Um, and uh, so uh, that was that's what solidified the existence of Sasquatch for me. When I saw that figure there and I could see that that was the culprit, I could see the massiveness of this thing. Not a whole lot mm-hmm. of detail, pretty typical, right? But I knew I was dealing, I knew what at that time what I was dealing with. Right. Uh, and uh, yeah, and since then, yes, I've had, since I've gotten involved with the Olympic Project, and whatnot. I've had other encounters, especially you know, I've had a couple of therm sightings uh, with uh, individuals. Um, I've had some very harrowing encounters with uh, 
Todd Hale and Chris Spencer and some of the other guys that work with me directly, uh, Rebecca mm -hmm. and Slick, other things have happened. Um, but that right there was an epitome for me. I mean, it really solidified Sasquatch existed and it lit a spark underneath my butt to uh, reach out to other people. You know, original yeah. question you asked. That's when I really thought after a while, I need to, I need to look, this isn't a one man show. I'm not a one man band. I can't do this myself. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, it's a double edged sword bringing other people in, but you know, one of the benefits is obviously bringing in their knowledge. Um, a different viewpoint you know they to me i've always found that when i go out with other researchers i learn something from them every single time i go i learn something a new way to research or something i can apply to my, how i research so um i i think that's awesome that you found a good team oh you yeah know? amazing yeah. team amazing team of individuals for sure and uh, on top of that um, I think he may be watching here. You probably have a fan from London in the group here, but Squatcher Metrics is uh, somebody mm -hmm. that I've, uh, speaking of data collection, Squatcher Metrics, you can find him on, on Instagram and Facebook. Um, what an amazing fellow. Um, he's an amazing analyst by trade. That's kind of mm -hmm. his job uh, yeah. to analyze certain things. Uh, but uh, collecting data, analyzing that, and putting that into a format where he yeah. shares this with a lot of researchers. It's something that's really uh, helped my research out, the Olympic Project's research out, and many other individuals and organizations across North America mm -hmm. with their research. So if you get a chance, I got to give the guy a, a plug because he's such an amazing Absolutely. guy and he's constantly um, working on some amazing things that I'm, I'm really shaping research. To me, what he's doing right now is the future of, of this research, uh, putting everything together in, in, in a format that you can look at and see patterns or non-patterns right. so right. you know shout out to squatcher metrics anybody in the you know, listening to the show if you're an enthusiast or or interested or a re researcher investigator whatever you want to call yourself check out squatcher metrics fantastic guy yeah actually i follow him on uh instagram um and i recently talked to emily fleur and oh, yeah. uh, she was also talking about him so yeah. yeah um yeah i i think like i said it having that big picture like that's that's vital. Um, okay, we had a couple questions up here. Uh, SoCal Squatch wanted to know: Have you researched with Chris Spencer? And you've answered that. <laughs> yeah, let me just say something about Todd. So Todd Hale works with the Olympic Project, and he's um, he's kind of the he's got a bit of a sense of humor. He's kind of the professional troll. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna give it to him. Yeah, yeah. No, he's he's he, he's fantastic, but he likes to have a good time, and we we take ourselves serious, but not too serious. So no. Thanks, Todd. And, <laughs> oh, he had another one. Has Shane been out with Beans Baxter? I have not been out with Beans Baxter, but he's going to be at the Middleline Falls, and yes. I look forward to meeting with him. And yeah. I believe you've had him on your show. So I did uh, recently, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I have not been out with Beans Baxter, Todd Hale, but I uh, I hope to uh, – <laughs> I look forward to meeting Beans Baxter and uh, seeing what yeah. uh, he's got to share. Yeah, he definitely seems like an interesting guy. Um, Jamie King, love Jamie King and Jenny. Um, Shane, how did you like yeah. Ohio? Oh, man. First of all, Jamie and Jenny King are two amazing people. I'm they a big are. fan of theirs. And yes, I had the privilege of seeing them out in Ohio alongside of many people, uh, mm -hmm. you know, friends that I've known for a while. And I met a bunch of new friends. I met Steve Coles for the first time, yep. Eric Altman, uh, Don Keating. Um, mm -hmm. I spoke at the Ohio uh, Triangle Conference put on by David Wickham. Yes. And I, man, I'll tell you. Uh, what an amazing area you, you get into Northern Ohio. My first time there, I've been all around the States, but never there. And it's, you're kind of going through all this flat farmland areas and you're thinking in your head, why would a Sasquatch be here? You know, <laughs> yeah. but then you get into parts like Kosh Coshocton, Ohio and those areas. And it made perfect sense to me. And I met so many people at this conference, really good folk. I mean, that's one of the things about Ohio. They got a lot of amazing people there. And uh, just good folk in general, but they have a lot of good witnesses and really yeah. honest people. And so when I started seeing the waterways and the amount of animal life out there, the mm -hmm. white-tailed deer, the groundhogs, everything, I was like, wow, what an amazing area. And between the conference, the people I got to meet, the people I got to speak with, Ohio is, uh, uh, I'm, going, I'm going back as soon as I can. That's awesome. Yeah, Ohio's on my bucket list. Uh, it's amazing, yeah. After Bigfoot Mecca this summer, you know, so maybe next year. <laughs> um, okay, so. 
He said, <laughs> he said, Shane's a rascal. Um, Stephen Hill wanted to know by spending so much time in one area, um, have you noticed any patterns from the, I call him Sasquai, by the way, um, from the Sasquai. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. You know, there are, you know, the longer you get into this and the longer you, you know, you're in the woods and the longer you actually look at the data you've collected and others have collected because, you know, Limber Project is just one organization, but there's many other organizations uh, in Washington, in, in the Western states and across the country. Yes, we've not noticed pattern patterns. I mean, basically, in certain areas, we can tell you possibly where your best chance to have a, a, a sighting or um, mm -hmm. something odd happen, right. you know, uh, or find impressions, you know, uh, May and June, spe specifically up in the Olympics, based on the the elk and deer calving, great times to be in the Olympics, you know, and, um, oh, man, I mean, there's just, there's a lot to it. And in, and in certain areas, you know, it's like there's a pattern where it seems, and it's something we've been talking about for quite a while now. It seems like, you know, the Sasquatch definitely make their rounds, whether it's, uh, and it's quite a lengthy description here, but there's certain areas we can go to and you, you know, you're probably not going to have anything happen, you know, just nothing going to happen. But if you're there between a certain amount of days, say seven, eight days, something may happen on that circle. It's almost like Sasquatch or a Sasquatch is making its rounds. And uh, so there's a lot of different patterns you can you find if you look at the material um, that you've collected and dissect it, you know, just like known animals, you know, it's a, as a hunter, you know, you know, you know, you can put up a game cram and all that good stuff. But if you're a good tracker or you pay attention to the environment, you're going to know when where deer are going to be at uh, or any other animal for the most part. You're going to kind of know that area. And so it's just about staying in one area for a lengthy period of time. And I have noticed patterns and the limb project has no noticed patterns. Um, and you can look at, you know, like Project Zoobook, for example, we have a bunch of different individuals, academic individuals that have worked with, we have zoologists, anthropologists, primatologists, marine biologists, and they're experts in their field. And they can tell you a lot about, you know, known primates, what gorillas, silverbacks will do, or lowland gorillas, or mountain gorillas will do, or chimpanzees, or bonobos, based on, uh, you know, obviously obser observing them. Now, we're not directly observing Sasquatch. But based on the track finds we've come across, based on the audio we're collecting, and some of our personal experiences, we gotta we, we're starting to it's starting to paint a picture, and that's why right. I'm excited about the future of this, because yeah. it the, you know research really has changed over the years. Uh, there are a lot of academic individuals, despite what people say, that are interested. They're in the Sasquatch right. closet sometimes, but yeah. they'll they're willing to talk with you and give their expertise. Uh, right. wildlife biologists and all that stuff. And the more you spend your time in one area, whether something's going on or not, don't get discouraged. You know, mm -hmm. I do believe Sasquatch has to, I mean, if they make an impression in one area, they'll be known. So they have to travel. I don't think they migrate, but I do think they're, you know, transitory. They move from elevation to elevation and mm -hmm. they will get around and you just got to be very observant. That is the key to science in general is, is observing. That's where science right. came from. It was observing and testing Absolutely. your hypothesis. And, so, uh, yeah, there are patterns out there and, uh, there's a lot of stuff I think we're learning, you know, there's one area in Southwestern Washington. I was out with, uh, Todd Hill and Chris Spencer and uh, Rebecca and slick and Jonathan Brown and Kirk Brown and a bunch of really good, um, uh, uh, a bunch of really good individuals, Barcatino. And yeah. there's one area we we've been looking at for years and, and I've been, I was kind of brought into this area. I had been there a few times, but we had some amazing stuff happen in this area between the audio and a tree coming down by our camp and the impressions we found. So it, we're now kind of looking at this area and trying to figure out the patterns there because there are patterns. There is, there's a certain type of Sasquatch, a certain colored Sasquatch in this area. It's been seen for like 20 years uh, from a small guy mm -hmm. to now he's a big guy uh, by different people, just r random people, people driving a road, a hunter, a police officer, whatever have you. And there's a lot of stuff going on in this area, but there are patterns it's not there all or it or they, we don't know, isn't there all the time, but it does come through there. Well, why? Right. You know why? And so um, there's just a lot of interesting things when it comes to that, that topic of patterns. Uh, I, I do think Sasquatch is very unpredictable in a lot of ways. I do believe that. But yeah. at the same time, there are certain things you can gather from your data, from what you gather that kind of paint a picture and point you, I think, in the right direction. Right. No, I agree with that. Um, 
I think, you know, I always say uh, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, whatever, their ultimate goal, you know, their main motivation for life is to survive and um, self-preservation. They are the ultimate survivalists. And so I think, do this is my question to you, do you think that a lot of their transitory patterns are due to uh, food sources or do you think it's due for uh, survival purposes to not be caught? I think for the most part, generally speaking, it's, it's, it's food and weather. So like I, I'm speaking specifically about uh, the PNW, the Pacific right, Northwest here. Right. You know, the higher elevations in the winter, you get snow. So all the animals, the elk and deer, they come down to the fields, the lower elevation. In the summer, they start trekking back up. And so that's where you're going to find the animals and that's where you're going to find the food, right. whether it's okay. huckleberry, Oregon grape, salal berry, uh, you name it. We got loads of options there. And then you get the salmon runs too. Up here, we got tons right. of salmon. If that's something that Sasquatch predates upon, which I do believe. And you got the, the you got the, the coast really close by and you have all the clams and with the Native yeah. Americans talk about them taking the salmon and the clams and the seashells. So for me, the transitory thing is all about um, the weather and the food sources. Mm -hmm. It just okay. like, I mean, it's, you know, it's not rocket science. I mean, you, as a yeah. human, you're not going to want to be, uh, you know, camping out in the snow right. for a lengthy period of time. Right, yeah, we do it right. for fun, right? But we don't make a right. living out of it. Right. We come down, we, we, we camp where it's comfortable and we find food where it's comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, but, there's a, so there's a lot of options up here in the Pacific Northwest. Now, when it comes to like up here, we have, uh, and I know other parts of the country, uh, Idaho, North Carolina, they have timber. So a lot of areas get timbered and, and timbering gets a bad name. But what timbering does, it attracts all the deer in the ungulates this area because with timbering, you take out a tree, an area or a forest in segments, the sun penetrates that area, the grass grows, and that's where the right. ungulates are all the animals. Well, that's where you get a lot of Sasquatch sightings. Is, I mean, some of the best FLIR footage we've taken or have seen is when we're in a clear cut focusing on this area and we see individuals walk into this area and you see deer and elk bedded down these areas. So I'm I'm pro timber, uh, you know, timbering, but at the same time, I do need think that uh, it, it in some cases it goes overboard. Uh, yeah. There's areas where, you know, where I live up here in Washington, I'm looking at the Cascades. I'm looking at an area and I just noticed today on the horizon, they're taking out the trees and I was a little bummed mm -hmm. to buy it. Now I got a better yeah. view of the mountains, but I love the trees. Right. Um, so I'm a little bummed out about that, but it is what it is. So yeah. in those cases, I think the Sasquatch are attracted. And you know, that's the thing with power lines as well. Mm -hmm. You know, you get so many reports of Sasquatch tra you know, traveling in power lines. Yeah. You know, well, I think it's because the power lines open up for the grass to grow and that's where the deer congregate. I mean, why do you think yeah. about, you know, you think about grave sites, for example, everything thinks there's uh, not everybody, but certain people think <laughs> there's something paranormal about Sasquatch hanging around a grave site. And I'm thinking the grave sites just down the road for me Ooh. are some of the greenest areas where the grass right. grows and the deer congregate in there and they eat the grass, the elk come down to eat the grass. Mm -hmm. I would expect Sasquatch to be hanging out there. If they're predating upon deer or elk, that's a perfect spot to ambush them. So, right. Um, kind of off topic there, but, you know, I, I just think it's, yeah. it's, um, you know, in these areas, it's, it is about the food sources and, and the climate. And so yeah. transitory, you can stay in a hundred mile area and, and live just fine and not be seen, especially if right. you're in small in number, which I believe Sasquatch is small in number. Right. Especially in the Pacific Northwest where it's just vast. I mean, it's just so vast up there, which I'm eager to see for myself. So, <laughs> um, so <laughs> On that topic, um, well, hold on. We had another question from Alan Lassiter that I'll slip in here. So you said, you know, stay in one area, research that area, um, learn that area, know that area, eat, sleep, and breathe that area. So how often do you go out and research? Uh, oh, man. Uh, so I moved up to Washington just to do this. I really did. When we came okay. across the nest, when, when, when the nest area that we're working on now was um, – brought to me and I got to see it for the first time. I thought, well, this is amazing. This is absolutely amazing. I have to move to Washington. And I was looking to move out of, uh, you know, the suburbs of Portland. I wanted, you know, I had access to a lot of areas, but I just, I kind of got sick of the, the, I've never been a city guy or even a suburb. I wanted to be out in the sticks. So I moved up to Washington, uh, finally got into a house up here and, and I'm in the woods now and I'm out every week every week, uh, uh, sometimes daily, sometimes every couple of days and out for lengthy periods of time, whether it's up in the Olympics or Southwestern Washington, I'm out all the time, but I have basically, basically right now, 
out two core areas in one's on the east side of the Olympics where the nests are at and then one down southwestern Washington. And both mm -hmm. are very productive areas. They have a lot of wildlife, a lot of encounters, a lot of history, uh, but they're just very productive. And that's where I want to focus my time in, is just in those right. areas as much as I can. I know a lot about the Olympics, but it's so vast. I'm still learning stuff today. I don't know yeah. it all. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, that's the, yeah. I always recommend to people, whether there's been an encounter or not in an area, look at what's viable in that area. Look what it would, you know, look at the animals in this area. Why would a Sasquatch be here? And maybe, just maybe, yes. there's not a lot of people going in the area. It takes a person and a Sasquatch to have an encounter. That's you know, it's true. like Vancouver Island's a perfect example. Most of the encounters are on one end of the island. The other end, I, where all the people are at. But the other end of the island, which, you know, Vancouver Island's a stone throw away from me. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of reports, but when people go there, they get reports. But so it makes sense. People right. have to see a Sasquatch. Sasquatch has to be there. But yeah. great areas to be had if if you look at what's viable in those areas. And just you know, if it's an area where not pe you know, not a lot of people traverse, big mm -hmm. deal. That's even better. I'd be heading out there. Who knows? Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, you're living the dream, my friend. Living the dream. <laughs> I am. Uh, I won't lie. <laughs> <laughs> um. I know it took a lot of work to get there, but I think that's awesome. Okay. Um, I think we had a, Jamie had a question. Do you think it's an advantage to camp near water? Yes and no. That's such a good question. Uh, yes and no. So the advantages are, are everything has to go to water at some point. And, you know, a fisherman, I love camping near water, but yes. if you're recording <laughs> audio, it sucks because all of your audio gets washed out by the water, depending on, you know, I mean, a lake, a lake is one thing. Uh, you can yeah. get away on a lake, but a lot of areas I go to are near rivers and, and they're yeah. big rivers, small rivers, creeks, and it, there's a lot of noise there. And it's I know Jamie colder. knows this. <laughs> yeah, it's usually colder. So, but I usually do, I mean, no matter where I'm at, there's always water. So it, whether mm -hmm. I'm, you know, half mile away or a couple of hundred yards away, I, I camp near water. I always do because I love the fish and I just love being near water. You know, if you're out for a week or a couple of days, you can go take a quick bath or shower and, um, you know, just enjoy the beauty of the water itself. But right. uh, absolutely, there's an advantage there. Like I said, all things um, need, to go, need to go to water at some point. And that's where I've been focusing my time with game cameras. You know, game cameras are like, oh, you know, people give them a bad name. But yeah. if you look at the vast majority of sightings where a Sasquatch has been surprised or a human's been surprised by seeing mm -hmm. them, it's along a river or something of that nature because That's the true. Sasquatch is in the water or there's a fisherman and here comes a Sasquatch or here comes a person. Both parties are like shocked. Why is that? Why is that? Because yeah. the noise, I believe the noise of the water protects yeah. the sounds. Uh, you you know, if you're so out there doing your solo thing, whether you're a Sasquatch or a person, mm -hmm. you're, uh, you're, 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 you're out there. You're not hearing something creep up on you. Look at the, the right. Patterson Gimlin film, which I believe is 100% legit. Patty, I think, was surprised. She got caught off guard because she heard ungulates or horses come down if she even heard them. Um, so if you're placing game cameras, I guess to get to my my thought process here, if you're placing game cameras, place them next to a river or a creek in a stump mm -hmm. or whatever have you. Uh, not on the water because you don't want a million shots of water you know, <laughs> flowing and think, sticks coming down there and whatnot. But yeah. if you can place it next to a creek or river, uh, mm -hmm. you know, parallel with it that is your best opportunity i think not just to get known really cool shots of known wildlife but your best opportunity to probably get a sasquatch on your camera i don't think enough people are doing that because most individuals that place trail cameras out there and not bigfoot related hunters they're putting them on game trails they have a certain i'm looking for a white tail right. i'm looking for a black tail i'm looking for a hog i'm looking for a bear or a cat they, yeah. they they know their quarry sasquatch researchers kind of do the same thing and mm -hmm. i'm of the opinion that no, no. Sasquatch probably, yes, they use game trails, but they're. Off trail. And they're not traveling the state. They'll, they'll, my thought process there, but water is awesome. No, I, I, I have to agree. I think that's a really good line of thought on that. Um, I would love to see more people do that. Uh, in places like southeastern Oklahoma and, you know, Falk and other places, definitely. Um, I think I think that would be a good way to go. I, I try to tell people, you know, um, game cameras, like when you set one up in the woods, um, you know, I had a friend that he, he cut down a bunch of branches to put his game cam up. And I was like, 
I, I mean, they can smell the cut wood. They see the wood. Um, they know that something is different here. They're going to go out of their way to go around it. I said, if, if I go into your house and put a game cam on your dining room table, you're going to know because it's your house. I said, I just feel like they know when something is different, you know, in that aspect. But close to water, it covers the sound and the scent. And the scent. Um, That's yeah, yeah, I didn't mention it. The scent. Yeah. Because there all these smells coming down the river. Mm-hmm. You know, so it covers yeah. the sound, smell, uh, yeah. and, you know, everything in some of these areas has to cross there at some point, you know. So you right. pick you, you pick a spot, you know, uh, and you go with it and you leave your camera out there for a lengthy period of time. Mm-hmm. Chances are you're not going to get a Sasquatch, right. but you never know. I think Sasquatch makes mistakes. But when you start hucking down limbs or something else I don't do, uh, and I'm willing to lose a camera. I don't use straps. I place them in stumps. I place, them, I don't <laughs> use the trap because a strap is a straight line along a tree, just like a camera. Yep. It's a square box, you know, yep. it's like it a painting on a tree, you know, breaks a picture the frame. line of vision. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't do that stuff. And, um, the only time I've gotten lucky, uh, what I consider lucky with this, with a trail cameras was when I was m- first moved up to Washington state and I was camping, camping on a buddy's property, a stone throw, a couple of, well, Air miles wasn't too far away from our nest study area, but I had my travel trailer and I put my cameras on my travel trailer. I wanted Mm -hmm. to make them a part of my travel trailer, part of something human, because a stone throw away again was a a gate where two different loggers at three o'clock in the morning, months uh, apart, had seen what they would describe as a a Sasquatch family. There was four of them. And Mm so um, I thought, well, while I'm out here, I'll put a game camera on my travel trailer, two of them. And um, for weeks, I was getting the known suspects. I was getting deer, the same does, uh, raccoons, coyote, uh, no bear. But one morning, my wife woke me up in the trailer. It's about 2 in the morning, one thirty, two in the morning. Again, magic hours, I call it. Uh, yeah. She heard something messing with our cooler outside. And here the ice swishing. And I, I about kicked myself. Why would you leave the cooler outside, idiot? There's bears out here. Right. Get out there. <laughs> yeah, I get out there and there's no uh, nothing to be seen. But I knew I had game cameras out there. Well, next day I wake up and, you know, I told her, well, something came back. I'd shoot it off. We didn't hear anything the rest of the night. Next morning, I get up and I, uh, I, I check my game cameras. Well, the one on the side of my trailer was, which was next to my wheel well had been triggered. Nothing caught on it. Mm-hmm. The one on my bumper, three feet off the ground was triggered. And I'm waiting for something, something had crossed there or triggered it. And I'm waiting, waiting. And then all of a sudden you see what looks like a bipedal figure walk right by it. This is one thirty in the morning. February 20 something, 24th, I believe, and 28 degrees outside. And we're, we're in a remote area. So I can pretty much rule out human. Right. And now I'm left with, okay, did I see a walking bear? Well, no, this thing was so fluid. Um, so game cameras do work depending how you place them. And if you're in the right area at the right time and Sasquatch do make mistakes, but if something small in number, like a Sasquatch, it's you're looking for a needle, needle, uh, needle uh, moving needle in a haystack, as Gunnar right. Monson always says. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. they do yeah. work. Um, I think they, I don't know. I, I just, I don't know. I haven't, I, I I'm just so ambivalent about them, I guess I would say. Um, but that's, yeah. that's my own opinion, just because <laughs> I, I haven't seen a lot of success around my parts with like my areas with them because we have so many hunters here and i think i think the sass just know they just mm-hmm. know they're like oh look at that i'm not gonna walk by that tree now like it's they just know um plus uh if it's in the middle of the woods again with the scent and everything um yep. jamie had another question is it a safety safety concern to be in an area where trees are being pushed over it is. Um, from what I've noticed, and I've had it happen to me twice. Once was up uh, in Mount Hood um, a year after uh, my initial encounter. Three o'clock in the afternoon, we heard whistles, uh, grunts, and a tree came across the trail right next to our tent, 30, 40 yards away. Um, but once again, 30, 40 yards away. Right. And then just last year, or this year, excuse me, uh, we had a tree come down in the southwestern area. Uh, after hearing a bunch of odd sounds and something stomping around the woods. But once again, it was behind our camp and Mm -hmm. a distance away. Um, It's like the rock throwing stuff. I don't know anybody, honestly, that's been hit by a rock. I've I've known lots of people. I've interviewed lots of people that had rocks thrown at them or pine cones or acorns thrown at them. 
Right. Now, some of the smaller stuff I've heard people, you know, uh, John Mainzinski, for example, he had uh, little acorn or pine cones thrown at his tent and they were hitting his tent and bouncing around him. Um, but when, if it is Sasquatch throwing these rocks and doing all this stuff, they never seem to, for the most part, you know, I mean, I guess if you got hit in the head with a rock, you're n you don't have a story to tell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Um, my experience is that it's, it's intimidation. It, right. They just want you out of there. Um, if you look at known primates like, um, you know, gorillas, they'll bluff charge you. They'll, mm -hmm. they'll throw, you know, huck water at you, do all sorts of stuff, but yeah, just are they, they don't charge you down now. Wrong, wrong scenario, wrong time. All bets are off with even known animals, let alone people, oh, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. you catch a, a weirdo in the woods. Who knows what's going to happen? I've so, always, I've always yeah. been really thankful that uh, Bigfoot throw rocks and not poop like other primates. <laughs> like we're very blessed you guys because <laughs> It could get real nasty real fast. I'm just saying. Might next be a big pile of poop. I, it could be, but then they would be throwing DNA evidence at us. And like I said, their main goal in life is to be elusive. And, uh, you know, I just, I, I just think people should be more grateful that it's rocks and not poop. I'm just going to, I should put that on a shirt. You should. Um, <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. But the, <laughs> the rocks for the most part, the experiences that I've heard, I think I know one person that got hit on the leg, but every other experience I've heard, it's been near them, but not, it has not hit them. And I mean, people have it like whiz right by their head or land right. at their feet, but never hit them. So I, I do agree that it's a territorial or a, you know, intimidation i mean yeah. they, I, I do believe that and maybe they make mistakes and actually kill somebody or whatever but the vast majority of them it's intimidation i at least i feel that way it's intimidation and if they wanted to hit you they could because if sasquatch does hunt deer or elk and i can't prove that but i do think based on the amount of witnesses i've interviewed over the years and and, and whatnot that right. they've seen this stuff happen sasquatch wants to hit you it will it just will um so yeah. it shows the amount of intelligence there to to end the accuracy, which is uh, if it's true, that's scary. I, um, I mean, the accuracy is yeah. crazy good. I've I've had um, people tell me about you know from the interviews I've done, throwing rocks, but also throwing uh, sticks, trees, and logs. I mean, just branches at them and just mm. missing them, and that's utterly terrifying. Um, yeah. <laughs> <No> <laughs> I mean, um, okay, so. I wanted to ask this earlier when you were telling me about your experience. Um, what do you think they are? What is your opinion on what Bigfoot is? You know, that's one of those questions I really don't have. An, I mean, obviously, I don't have an answer to, but yeah. one that I leave very open. You know, um, I always say if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck and acts like a duck, it's a duck. And I think Sasquatch is very much a terrestrial uh, thing. Mm -hmm. Is it a primate? You know, I, I allude to primates all the time because of some of the work. Uh, with the nest study area we've been working on for yeah. years. I mean, the, the nest, something made those nests and the hairs come back primate, you know, uh, visually speaking, uh, the tracks, the hand casts we found around these areas, some of our experiences, some of the vocals, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so some of Sasquatch uh, um, behavior, uh, yeah, it's very primate-like, you know, non-human primate-like. And then some of its behavior is human-like uh, with yeah. some of the vocals and some, the way it behaves. And there's an intelligence there. So I never say it's a, you know, people, oh, it's not just some dumb ape. Well, no. I'll tell you what, uh, I know uh, friends in the field, professionals that deal with apes and are, there's no dumb ape, uh, gorillas, chimpanzees, but they're all very, very intelligent and they're still learning stuff about them. Mm -hmm. Now you talk about something that's way beyond these individuals. Um, I, I don't know what Sasquatch is. What I do know is that it does have attribute. Well, what I'll claim to know is that mm -hmm. it acts, it's got attributes closely resembling known primates. Mm -hmm. and it's got attributes that resemble human. Um, and uh, they're very rare. You know, uh, you know, going back to my encounter, the reason I think we had that 2-9 encounter, because that's so rare. Not many people uh, have a 2-9 a encounter in the woods. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I think it's because we got up on a ridge line, and it's something I've coined, not trying to re reinvent the wheel here, but I, I like to call them ridge apes. Because right. I think we got up on this ridge line, got lost, hiked 17 miles. We're traversing through this area. Some of the bear sign we saw maybe have been Sasquatch sign. Mm -hmm. I wasn't in Sasquatch mode. We were making, you know, buddies knocking pots. We're hiking, we're urinating, we're drinking, you know, water and all that. And we're just, you know, traversing yeah. this area. And we stirred something up and we're like, what are these humans doing up on this ridge line way off trail? I'm going to, we, we're, we're going to follow them because we're easy to track scent wise and go back to the yeah. camp and try and get them out of here. They overstep their area. They 
went into an area that we were residing in. That's my thought process. It took me a long time to come to that. I thought at times I'm like, well, we were blocking our access to the lake for water. This is the easiest access to the lake. But that didn't make sense to me. Yeah. And then I thought, start thinking about the ridge line where we were way up there off trail and being obnoxious. And, uh, you know, whether it's a family unit to, or one, an individual, I don't know. But I really think that was what transpired there. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I think that makes sense. Uh, to, I always wonder if Bigfoot do run humans out of that area to keep their family safe or just to keep their food source safe. Um, it seems like humans, if I were a Sasquatch, I would see humans as a disease, like, oh good, here comes two humans that are camping. Now there's going to be more that come and camp and they're going to overtake this area. That's how I would see it. I would throw poop. If I was a Bigfoot, I would throw poop at humans. <laughs> okay. Straight up. <laughs> but, um, I, I'm glad I, you're not a Sasquatch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people are glad I'm not a Sasquatch because then I could like, you know, um, <laughs> But I, I agree. I think that they just, I think they try to get people out of there in a, a least aggressive way as possible, but as a forceful way as they can too, that's not, you know, take them out. Um, hold on. I had, there was another question. <laughs> oh, you guys, I won't throw poop in anybody. You got to make a shirt, Lauren. You got to make I a know, shirt I have to now. Have to. <laughs> um, Steven said, uh, I'm going to laugh at a, if a Bigfoot throws poop at you. I'm like, I will get DNA. So I am not going to complain about that. That would yeah, be scary, fine. Carry a trash bag. <laughs> I know. Like I'll catch take one it. for the team. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine with that. Um, I had another question over here. Let me go look. Okay. Alan Lasseter wanted to know, do the native Americans in your area talk about Bigfoot or is that taboo in your area? A bit of both, honestly, depends on the tribe, uh, but the vast majority of them are open. They talk about it. Uh, I speak at the Sasquatch. I've spoken at the Sasquatch Summit up here in Ocean Shores, Washington, mm -hmm. on a reservation. Um, and they're amazing, um, amazing group. And they talk about it openly. Um, and, uh, of course, working with Jonathan and Sarah Brown out of the Chehalis, they live on a reservation and probably have – you know, one of the top FLIR uh, images of videos out there, bar none, mm -hmm. they were using one of our FLIRs uh, borrowed from the Olympic project, but they captured it mm -hmm. and it was on an Indian reservation. And it's amazing footage to me because I've stood there, I've seen it. Uh, so they're, they're, the vast majority are open to it, especially mm -hmm. the younger generation. Some of the elders can be standoffish. Right. Uh, some of them think it's taboo to talk about, not taboo, but not a good thing to talk about it. But no, there's a lot of openness up here. And we built really good uh, friendships with a lot of the That's Native awesome. Americans up this way. And there's a ton. And they all have stories. They all have different names for Sasquatch, but they all talk about Sasquatch. And okay. so one of the things that's really neat about living up here is the amount of Native Americans that live on these areas that have stories going back hundreds of years. And I've heard some amazing ones and stuff that, you know, like, uh, you know, their forefathers and, and whatnot going yeah, right. out and salmon fishing and tying up the salmon and Sasquatch takes their salmon. Or, right. uh, yeah, all that. So, so a lot of good correlations and, but they're, they are for the most part open to talk about it. That's awesome. And, you know, I always, I always think to myself, you know, that can be helpful in your research because let's say they've had those experiences with the salmon, then, you know, again, you can add that little piece into your research to me. Mm -hmm. That's what I get from it. Um, okay. On to gear. What is the most valuable a piece of equipment that you have to have when you research? That you can't go without. Oh man, um, I would say your brain, <laughs> but you should be taken out with you regardless. <laughs> Dang it! Hold on, let me add that to my list. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you would be surprised. So, um, uh, it just it really depends on what you're you're trying to accomplish and what you're doing and where you're going. You know, uh, yeah. I would say almost it just really depends. Um, a compass to me, it's like. Everybody's thinking, okay, track casting or therm or, you know, this or that. Mm -hmm. But if you're not comfortable where you're going, you know, you must really know an area. You must always honestly tell somebody where you're going. I know everybody thinks they're a, a bad mamma jam, mamma jam and go out wherever they want and do. <laughs> yeah. But bad things happen to good people, smart people. Uh, there was a guy I think was out in Wyoming recently, right? Uh, was it Wyoming or uh, Montana? Uh, uh, an outdoorsman, a guide, a fishing guide. And he got mauled to death by a grizzly bear. He turned his back 
And the fa- they come to find out that this grizzly had buried a moose, probably had buried a moose body and, and was protecting its its food source, its cache. So you got to be prepared for everything. Put Sasquatch aside. Make yeah. a game plan, you know. Make a game plan. Yeah. Make sure you have everything you need in your pack. Because up here in the Pacific Northwest, I've been caught in some... I went out with Mark Marcel, Abe Cannon, years ago, and we went out to the cabin site, and we got caught in a blizzard. It was it, we're f- five six miles in Mount St Helens, and it was a blizzard. And thank God I had you know there was a couple of people on our trip that um, got hypothermic almost because it set in so quick. But I, I I managed to build a fire. I managed to make a, a couple of quick shelters, mm-hmm. uh, and all you know, and I had bandages and all you know, food and all this stuff, right. some to get warm. That is so. Your backpack and what you have in your backpack pack as far as survival stuff. I don't care if you're, you're going on a nice sunny day. What if you get bit by a snake or a you know a spider or you you know um, you trip and break your leg or fall down a hill? You have to have two of everything: matches, uh, you know, something to start a fire, ways to keep warm. Um, always tell somebody where you're going and do not deviate from that path. As soon as you deviate from that path, if something happens, you're uh, leaving not just you know SARS search and rescue in trouble, but your family members. Always think about those people. And I, I, I'm guilty. I've been guilty of it. I've been yes. guilty. Oh, look, there's a bone over there off trail. Let me go check that bone out. I uh, and, well, we all we all do it, right? But yeah. the most important thing is know your environment. Be prepared for your environment. Mm-hmm. And then when you go into the woods and you're so prepared, you know the area, you got maps, you got compass, you got all this stuff. When you step in there, your mind is focused on the research and not mm-hmm. where's my car keys? Where How do I get back to my car? Mm-hmm. Where's my water source? You know, you're so prepared that you can actually focus on your environment and what you're looking at, what you're looking for. And it just makes everything so smooth that way. Because when you go in the woods and you're nervous or you forget something or you don't know, you know, uh, something, <laughs> you're, yeah. you're asking for disaster and you're really not conducting good research. And I learned this the hard way over and over again. Yeah. Uh, I'm fortunately now, I think I'm pretty on it uh, as much as one can be. And so, you know, and then when you get into the research side, man, if you can pack in a couple of pounds of hydrocal, you know, casting material, mm-hmm. um, a DNA kit, you can collect hair properly with, you know, paper bags and tweezers and all that stuff. If that's what you want to do. A lot of people just want to go out and experience it. Good for you. But if you're trying to collect data, take a pen and paper, use your cell phone and take notes. You know, you don't have to take a pen and paper nowadays. You can just type in notes or speak into your phone, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, um, all that stuff adds up to really solid research, in my opinion, mm-hmm. uh, but also have plenty of maps on you. Know the area you're going into. Don't just walk into an area blindly. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and all the other stuff, therms and all that stuff, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate. I own quite a few thermal units and mm-hmm. I, a lot of audio units. I will say I would take as soon as you st- step out of your vehicle. And this is something David else has taught me and Chris Spencer and myself. We, we really pay attention to this. As soon as you step out of your vehicle in an area of interest, hit that recorder, start it right away. Yeah. Yeah. Don't start going down the trail and go, oh, I need some recorder. Because some of the coolest stuff you will ever hear sometimes is when you step out of your, re- your vehicle. Right. So an audio recorder is a must. If you don't mm-hmm. have one, record off your phone. But a lot of times people set that recorder, they hear something and they go to, oh, I'll start recording. Nothing happens. And so right. all you got once again is a story. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's uh, really good advice. All of that is really good advice. Um don't become a missing 411 case if you can mm-hmm. help it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It happens too often, unfortunately. And we, you know, part of the Olympic project, what we do is we, we actually actively search for missing people. Um, there's really? one guy in the area um, that I had my encounter in the year prior to the same month, he went missing in this area and he's still missing and they had all sorts of people. I don't know how this guy went missing. It's, it's mind boggling to me, but mm-hmm. you know, Jacob, uh, Jacob Gray was a guy up in the Olympics we were looking for and they eventually found him way up on a mountain where he shouldn't have been, uh, especially with the snowfall that year, it would have been, you know, eight, nine feet. They don't know how he got up there, but he uh, didn't really, he told people the general path he was going to take, but he never told people he he deviated and then Mm -hmm. he did some weird stuff. And um, so we do look for missing people and they go missing all the time. The vast majority of them show up, but there's, I can think of four or five right now in my head that every time I'm in certain areas, I'm looking for four or five found in a year, two years, sometimes 10 years. Uh, and so I didn't know that you guys did that. So that's awesome. Yes. Oh, every time there's always up here in the Pacific Northwest, there's always somebody missing in an area you're, you're researching or, or hiking in or fishing. Mm-hmm. And so I always look in different areas that I'm not researched for. I'm hoping to give families closure and come yeah. across something like that. Cause you know, just don't put people in that position. You think it can't happen to you. It can, it really yeah. can. 
Garmin and Reach. I will just go ahead and give a plug. Yes. Um, my Great husband help. hiked the Superior Hiking Trail, and um, it dropped breadcrumbs, and he could text me from it. It was well, well worth the monthly payment for it. Let me tell you guys. Peace of mind for me. Peace of, peace of mind, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Peace of mind, yeah. Um, it kept his path so I could see everywhere he went. So that was, I, it's well worth the money if you are going to be going out in the woods like this. Um, there's other variations of it, but that's the one we had. We had success with it. I know others that have the exact same one and have had them for years. Yeah. Um, so... I, I think I know the answer to this already, but I'm going to go ahead and ask, <laughs> what is the best piece of evidence that you have seen so far <laughs> besides the Patty film? <laughs> oh man. Well, I'm going to tell I'm, and I'm going to be maybe a little arrogant here. Uh, only because there's a reason I moved up to Washington mm -hmm. um, is yeah. <laughs> the net is, is the nest area we're working on. There's just yep. nothing like it, you know, and I'm very skeptical. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I know Sasquatch exists period. Uh, right. But, I'm the nest study area we're working on for a number of years. And, uh, some people, you know, uh, quit talking about it. Well, no, cause it's ongoing. We're I mean, just, just last year, 2020, February of last year, Todd Hale and I walked in on something, making one of these nests. We didn't see it, but, uh, right. uh cumulatively we've come, you know, we had Cliff Berkman come out. He's a good friend of ours. Mm -hmm. He came out and helped us cast hand impressions, foot impressions. Um, and then the collection of the huckleberry and, and the hairs, mm -hmm. It is the most profound thing that I've ever dealt with. And I, I've seen stuff through FLIR. You know, I've had my sighting. This is something concrete. Uh, right. You know, all the, you know, photos, FLIR, eyewitness encounter. They're great. They're fantastic. But they, mm -hmm. this is something concrete. Something's building these nests. And the original nest area that was discovered was discovered by a timber cruiser. And in his 27 years, had never seen anything like this, nor had the other individuals that have been brought out to this area, bear biologists, right. the DNR, uh, the timber owner of this property, mm -hmm. none of them in their years, 250 years within this, this timber agency. And my buddies, Derek Randalls and James Milling, that first saw these nests, they had never seen anything like this. So to me, this is the most compelling thing for me personally. And right. I've seen a lot of great um, things over the years. You know, I was out in Ohio and I saw a really good, uh, an older gentleman from that area had what looked like a little Sasquatch on his um, game camera. I mean, it looked just mm -hmm. like a little Sasquatch, a gray colored or whitish gray. And I was like floored, but I've right. seen stuff like that over the years. Um, but they're, you know, these, a lot of these individuals aren't willing to share it. They just want to show somebody and, you know, and that's yeah. cool. I, I'll take that and I'll live yeah. with that. Right. Um, so I've seen a lot of good photos, a lot of that stuff, but you know, when you can, you can touch and feel and see stuff uh, mm -hmm. like the nest area, it's profound and the amount of audio we pulled out of this area. So we're not just talking about nest or hair or hand impressions or foot impressions mm -hmm. or even possible sightings with Derek Randall's and his wife in this area. We're also talking about audio and audio mm -hmm. that is just unreal and it's consistent. And so speaking of patterns, Lauren, you know, one we came across, you know, we were led to this original nest study area by a timber cruiser and to date or to that time up until about 2020, we had discovered 22 nests along this ridge line. Over a couple of years, we came across 22 of them on these different fingers. You know, some were in, in groups of seven, some were in groups of three or four, some were in groups or just one. Um, you know, when we, and, and we, we, we hypothesized that they were made in the month of February or March based on the salmon run and the huckleberry mm -hmm. still being in this area because it's kind of a microclimate. The huckleberry still is prevalent in this area. And then Todd Hill and I discover another one, but actually being made in the month of february the tail end of february and so mm -hmm. patterns is it right. every every four years they're making these things you know for a birthing process possibly um it, definitely in the months of february or march whatever is making these you can argue that point but these nests are being made and constructed mm -hmm. and uh, something's making them and they're different sizes large eight nine feet across to three or four feet across a foot in depth so there's right. patterns there so for me lauren answered question the nest the nest area is definitely uh you know, yeah, you know, one of the most amazing things I've ever, I mean, the most amazing thing I've ever been involved with. And to me, it's, uh, it, uh, is, uh, the most compelling thing. Um, right. though there's a lot of compelling things out there. I don't want to take away from other individual right. groups or organizations. I talked to a lot of them and they're working on really amazing things, great right. things. They have new ideas. Uh, but for me personally, it's the nest study area. No, I think that's amazing. I've heard, I've, heard you talk about that before i've heard it from others um i followed your nest stuff um nest research 
And I've heard, you know, feedback on it. Oh, well, you know, the Olympic project and their nest, don't they know that those are just from bears or don't they, you know, and I get that a lot and I'm just like, oh yeah, yeah, me too. I mean, I guess, so going back to you've actually had, you know, and I want to just put this out there for everyone else. I've already seen you post this, but um, that you have had bear biologists basically verify that this is not or Oh yeah. Bear biologists, wildlife biologists. And um, I bump into a lot of black bear. Uh, between Oregon and Washington, uh, a lot of black bear. I've seen black bear scraping trees, making their beds. I've seen a lot of known animals do that. Uh, one of the things people say to me all the time, oh, it's it's a, it's you know, a wood rat or a muskrat. I've seen th- hundreds of muskrat nests and you always find feces and it's got a smell to it. And they make mounds. They don't make nests. They don't make bird nests. Uh, same with bear. Uh, bear will scrape something and make a bed. And I come across black, I run into black bear all the time right. in, in their beds and elk beds and deer beds. Uh, this isn't a bed, it's a nest. And so yeah. that's what separates it. And it's formulated. Ask Dr. Meldrum when he came out there and he saw that huckleberry boughs were pushed into the ground and then the nest was formulated around it. Mm-hmm. It took intelligence. It took time. Derek Randalls and I actually went out and built one of these nests just to see what it would take. And between us, it took us between 40 and 45 minutes to build one of these things and collect yeah. stuff from 25 feet away. So something's going out of its little pocket 25 feet away to build one of these nests. So. I, yeah, I have to agree. it's very interesting. It Oh, it's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Um, I, you know, I've heard of, uh, of other nests, I guess, in other countries. Um, mm-hmm. and they, they weren't like this one. They weren't right. like these. So, um, the first time I heard you mention these nests, it was a couple of years ago and it just caught my attention because that's something that I had, I've been doing this with my mom for like 20 years and, um, I, I had never heard that ever. <laughs> so I think it's fascinating as well. Um, is there any experience that you have yet to tell about that you would like to share? Oh, um, you know, I said over the years, um, I've been fortunate, I think, to be put myself in positions where we've had encounters. I mean, there's there's a lot. Uh, but, you know, that may sound arrogant, but I spend, especially in the last, you know, since 2012, I, I spent so much time in certain areas so much time that where nothing's happened, you know, you go months without anything happening, but every once in a while you have something happen. You know, I mean, I remember a time out and I was out in the, in the, you know, before I moved up to Washington, I was out in the Tillamook uh, national forest in an area where there's been a ton of sightings and we were even working with a couple of, um, or a, uh, ranger in this area that would give us reports. He was a very friendly guy. And, uh, you know, one of these evenings, you know, that, I mean, there was one evening where my buddy, um, Larry Turner was out with me and he had his dog and we heard a whistle off to our left at 1138 night, 1138 night. Cause I looked at my watch and this whistle was very coarse and the dog, his dog would never chase after anything, but he chased after this whistle and Larry goes, Larry, you know, Cody, get back here. And Cody comes back. Well, off to our right is another whistle, clear course whistle. And the dog chases after it again, you know, uh, and the dog comes back, but I've heard whistles before and I'm not a big fan of whistles. Usually when I hear a whistle that I, I associate possibly with something that I'm not familiar with. I get a little bugged out because I've had weird stuff happen with whistles. Right. Um, uh, you know, same area. Uh, I was out with Cindy Cadell, who's a archaeologist and works with the Olympic project it is a part of the Olympic project. And um, she went to bed. Uh, we were out camping in this area. And I saw after staying up for an extra half hour, it's raining. I'm getting soaking wet and I'm ready to call it. And I'm flinging around and I see what I looks like a head behind a tree. And I'm watching this thing and I'm trying to reel, reel out raccoon and all the known things, but it's right. moving in and out behind a tree. It's bobbing and weaving. And so then it creepy. looked like there was a shoulder and said, well, shoot, this particular flare I had at the time couldn't record. It was a monocular. And I thought, well, you know, I, I, I'm the sort of guy that hates, uh, you know, stories. I wanted at least mm-hmm. to have a witness. So I said, hey, Cindy, I, I knock on her, on her, on her tent and say, hey, wake up, get out of here. And she comes out and she's looking around. She doesn't see it. I'm like, great, it left. And then all of a sudden she goes, oh, I see it. And then she goes, well, is it a, a rabbit, a raccoon? And I said, well, no, it's first of all, there's a brush line there. It's at least seven okay. feet off the ground. And then she's looking at it. She goes, oh, is there two of them? And I said, two of them? She goes, oh, wait a minute. Oh, that looks like a shoulder. So what she was seeing, as she described later, was a shoulder on one side, a shoulder on the other side, because this thing had moved from tree to tree. She found it in another area. And this mm-hmm. thing was moving around, bobbing. And then she goes, Hey, and as soon as she did that, when she projected her voice through the rain, this mm-hmm. thing hit the ground like a ton of bricks and it freaked oh her out. Gosh. She'll tell yeah. you, it freaked her out. Yeah. It just, it went from this to boom, straight down. 
And I eventually said, uh, cause I'm the individual that will always approach something. I, I don't want to be ambiguous. I want to know what it is. So Absolutely. I said, keep the flare on me. I'm going to walk yeah. towards it. And I walked towards it and I never, we never saw anything. Next right. day I wake up and we found a nice impression out in this area and some scuff marks. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's no doubt if you spend the time out in these areas, you know, and, and I got plenty of interesting and somewhat mm -hmm. ambiguous stories, you know, trees being pushed over and right. all that, but, uh, lots of stuff like that. Uh, but to date, I've only had the one sighting yeah. visually without a flare. I, I believe right. I've had two, two under a flare. Uh, one was mm -hmm. with Derek Randall's where we were up in the Olympics and we both saw the same thing. And there was two individuals and looked like it put its arm on the tree and then walked up the trail. One was much larger than the other. And we did a recreation and one had to be at least seven foot and the other was probably around six foot. But uh, yeah, lots of stuff like that. Um, but That's I'm very awesome. excited about I'm very excited about what Todd Hale and I came across last February uh, with uh, everything that tr transpired after that. And the months we spent in this area recording, and collecting data mm -hmm. uh, for the first time in four years, five years, we came across a new nest in the making. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, it tells me we're on the right path, the right track. And, uh, you know, maybe looking at real patterns here, real patterns. So, no, I, you know, back to the patterns with the nest, you said, you know, you didn't know if, um, I think, is it probable that they build the nest in this area and then go to another area to build nest for the next cycle or, you know, something like that? That's a good question. And I love that question because I do have my own ideas and a lot mm -hmm. of the individuals in the Limp Project agree with me. I don't think Sasquatch makes nests every day or every night or even right, that yeah. often. I do believe they're made for a reason. Mm -hmm. And that reason for me, based on the number of nests, the size of the nest, based on a couple of nests that were found a couple of feet off the ground in the huckleberry bushes. So you have the ground nest and then you have these two nests in different areas that are made in the huckleberry bushes. They can't right. support weight but they're formulated and look exactly like what's on the ground, almost mm -hmm. like a practice nest. So I think these are birthing or nursery nests. Right. Uh, you have, uh, you know, especially in the months of February, and March, you have salmon runs in this area. You have the microclimate of the huckleberry still being around a lot of berries being around in this area, mm -hmm. lots of ungulates. You have just a tremendous area where it's remote. It's hard to get to. You're concealed both up top with, uh, you know, you can't fly over this area. Yeah. The tops of the trees cover everything, and then you build these nests. To me, these are birthing or, or uh, you know, nests like that. If you look at orangutans, for example, just as a comparison, mm -hmm. they give birth every six to eight years. I really do believe Sasquatch is, you know, small number and probably something similar. Maybe it's four to eight. Years. I don't know, but I do believe it's not every year. I believe mm -hmm. you have to have a female, you know, obviously a female and a male in the right, right. circumstances to give birth. In this area, just maybe the perfect storm to right. build nests, you know, and, uh, and, and, and historically speaking, uh, I talk about this all the time because I, I really hadn't heard about much nests until we came across, you know, we were led to these nests mm -hmm. and then I did research on it and lo and behold, there have been nests found throughout history. Bluff Creek, for example, 1967, Patterson Gimlin film, everybody's familiar with Lyle Laverty, who was interviewed by, uh, Daniel Perez of Bigfoot times. Lyle Laverty was a timber uh, cruiser. He worked for the timber agency and he came across a nest above Scorpion Creek. Mm -hmm. Well, Scorpion Creek feeds into Bluff Creek. It's a stone throw, throw away from where Patty was home. And there was a giant right. nest found there. If you right. look at Patty, you look at Patty, she looked like she had either given birth or was about to give birth. You just look at her mm -hmm. morphology, look at her body. Right. Um, there's nests found in California, Oregon, Alaska, Montana. There's been other nests found and they're almost always, almost always found by somebody in the timber company because it's way off trail they have a mm -hmm. job to do these aren't areas you're going to be fishing hiking hunting they're just not they're nasty they're hard to get to there's yeah. at, you can't see a few feet in front of you like there's we go to you know you know we bear we bumped into uh because it's we're you know traversing through terrain that we can't see anything you know i mean there's right. just it's timber surveyors that find this stuff but you know or somebody in the timber company so yep. um there are representations of other nests found but just never 23 to date now that we've come across mm -hmm. never anything like this and they've never been documented like this so i'm i know i've talked to other individuals uh last couple of years that have come across similar things in other states you know ohio's got their own nest stuff um, um oklahoma's got its own nest stuff florida's got its own nest stuff so there is something to this i really do believe and i do believe it's sasquatch related why it has probably got to do with uh birthing no, I have to agree. Um, 
or the other side of it from Cryptidville. Bigfoot, <laughs> <laughs> Bigfoot must set the mood with huckleberry wine, glowing orbs, and foggy moonlight. In the jungle, the <laughs> mighty jungle. Are we not? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, um, I think I have to agree. Just based on the pattern that you found with them, that makes the most sense to me. I can't imagine any other reason a Sasquatch would need it. Maybe like a corral for small food, but even then it just doesn't fit as well as birthing this. So I have to agree. Um, okay. Last question. And thank you so much for coming on oh, and, and you. putting up with, with, I I've been very curious to interview you for a long time uh, myself. So future projects, do you have any future projects planned? Um, speaking engagements and all of that as well, that can be included, but future. <laughs> well, plans. Yeah, I have, too many actually and that's why you really got it in this field or any field in general i don't care what field you're in you have to narrow it down you have to be specific if you get your, you spread yourself out too much you spread yourself too thin mm -hmm. so loads of projects um but we really dialed it in like i was saying to you earlier we have two areas one's the nest area and there's one area in southwestern washington where uh, we're really adamant about um audio you know long-term audio we put a lot mm -hmm. of long-term audio that record uh you know, thanks to people like David Ellis and Chris Spencer, right. uh, that uh, we, we put a lot of long-term audio. They record for multiple, multiple weeks. And so long-term audio is one of our key aspects. It kind of lets us know what's going on in an area why we're not there, which is key. And then, of course, spending a lot of time in these areas. These two core areas, we, we're spending a, a lot of time hiking, exploring, and uh, immersing ourselves in these areas. And so that's, that's the main goal. Now, we do have a, between a couple of us, I, we do have personal goals. One is, and we got ideas of how to do this, but we want to really get something on FLIR this year, uh, which we've done in the past, but something really solid. Uh, not, it won't prove Sasquatch. Don't get me wrong. I know that. But right, right. for our own research, just to see if we, could, we can actually get something on FLIR in an area where we think that Sasquatch does get fairly close to our camps periodically, not all the time, very rarely, but when it does, it's, it's just one of those things where it's off the hook. And you got to be prepared because I've been caught off guard. I admit it, I've been caught off guard so many times. Think, you know, nothing's going on for two or three days and you, 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 you take your foot off the pedal and that's when it hits and that's when it happens and you're not prepared. Yeah. So it's about being prepared, but having a goal. My right. goal is to get something on flare, something really good, something really <laughs> good. Um, and I think between um, our group, we're capable of doing that. We spent, we spent, and there's a lot of groups that individuals capable of doing that, but mm -hmm. it's about being adamant and, you know, those boring times, those lame times, not letting your foot off the pedal. As soon as you do, that always seems to be when something happens and then you screw up and then you're just like, oh, I got a cool story. All right. Yeah. You know, oh, you know, that's not good enough. It's just not good enough. So definitely want to yeah. get something on flair. Um, and then, you know, continue documenting the areas we're in because it is painting right. a picture, whether it's a foot cast we come across or a trackway or a hair Absolutely. or audio. Uh, it's really just trying to figure out what's going on in these areas. Why, 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 why? You know, I so. know. And the more you learn, the more you don't know, honestly. <laughs> the more questions you get. <laughs> yes. Um, but with the flare, you said, you know, even if you don't get a great image, it's great for y'all's research. To me, each little thing we get is a piece of data that we can put towards the bigger picture. So um, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's great what you guys are doing. Honestly, um, you know, I always tell people with research, Nobody knows the exact correct way to research, right? Nobody has the corner there's market. There's no experts. On, there's no experts. Nobody knows everything. Um, but for me, it's, I always tell people, do what feels right to you. Um, learn everything you can. Don't ever act like you know it all. Keep hmm. learning. Keep trying to advance your research. Um, but it, to me, y'all's research always, re like it feels the best to me. It, it resonates the best with me. Um, so you guys keep doing what you're doing. I think if anyone's going to prove it, I, hopefully you guys will do that, you know, because you guys, y'all are all out in the woods. You're doing big things and y'all, y'all are going about it in a really good way. You know, you're not, um, I, I hate to say this, but you're not, you know, trying to cut others off at the knees to further mm -hmm. your own research. You know, you guys, y'all are going about it in the right way. So I applaud you guys and keep doing what you're doing. Well, you rock, Lauren. It's been a pleasure being on the show. And, <laughs> you. you know, if you're not having fun at doing this stuff, it, you know, yes. and uh, you're being egotistical, uh, you're in the yeah. wrong, you know, you know, that's not the Olympic project. It's not the group I associate myself with. Right. Uh, we have fun. 
we enjoy ourselves. Yeah. We take ourselves serious, but not too serious. And uh, we know that uh, we're not the end all be all. There's other great individuals and groups out there right. doing. I mean, I, 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 I follow a lot of people. I don't always comment, but I, a lot of good yeah. people, solid people doing great research out there. And, and you know, uh, you know, just don't, uh, don't let it go to your head. You come across something neat. Awesome. Hey, yeah. man. But uh, don't let it go to your head because there's a lot of people that have come before us. You know, we're staying on the shoulders of giants, some really good people, Absolutely. you know, Absolutely. that have done amazing things. So take, don't take that for granted and just know that, uh, you know, we'll just have fun. That's what I'm going to say. Just have fun at yeah. it. Yeah. Have fun and, and be kind. You yes. guys know me. Y'all know that's what I always say. And I mean it just, man, with everything y'all do, just be kind. Because uh, it, it it's harder to... Uh, it's going to be harder for this topic to progress if we are all eating our own. So you guys <laughs> just be kind. It takes like so much less effort to just be kind. Just, and if you, if you don't have anything nice to say, then just don't say anything at all. Yeah. That's I'll all add one more thing. No, I just, one more thing. <laughs> you, you made a great point there. And that is, you know, if you're so focused on what other people are doing, mm -hmm. you got to stop and ask yourself, what are you doing? What do you bring to the table? Because absolutely, you know, it, it, just focus on what you're doing. And run with it. And if you think you're, you know, you feel like you really bring something to the table. Psh, awesome. Awesome. But yeah. the more time you focus on someone else that you disagree with, or you, you know, yeah. you think doing something stupid or, you know, uh, yeah. whatever you're wasting time. Life's too short. <laughs> Enjoy yeah. it. Focus on yourself, what you're yeah. doing. And uh, if you feel like it, bring it to the table. I saw a comment there a minute ago about just because it's not reported, basically it doesn't mean it's not happening. And that's so true. A Absolutely. lot of, a lot of people don't report it or don't share their stuff in, you know what? That's up to them, but they're, they're mm -hmm. still great people probably doing amazing things. So yeah, absolutely true. I agree completely. Thank you again for coming on tonight. Seriously. Uh, you guys are awesome and you know, keep on keeping on with all of your projects because each thing that you do is furthering this topic and we appreciate you. <laughs> Thanks for having me on the show, Lauren. All right. Thank you. Hang tight. Cause I want to chat with you after we go off air, if that's all right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you everyone for coming out and supporting us and listening to Shane. Um, you guys go ahead and hit that like button. That way we can, uh, you know, keep bringing on these great guests. I really hope you enjoyed tonight's show. Don't forget to drop a comment and let me know what you thought, like, and subscribe. You know, I want to give a special shout out to the affiliates of Nightcaller's Bigfoot Radio. Go check out their sites, give them a like and support them because they're all awesome. First of all, we have Bigfoot Society podcast. That's with Jeremiah Byron, and he is putting out great content, you guys. He is bringing on strong guests, scientific guests. He's having people on with experiences. You guys need to go check him out. Um, also, Where in the Folk, that's a paranormal group, and they interview other people about their paranormal experiences. I've been on their show. I've had other um, associates on their show. They are a really great group. Uh, really funny bunch of guys. You guys go check it out. Uh, Bigfoot Crossroads. Matt is launching Bigfoot Crossroads this week. So you guys go check out Bigfoot Crossroads. Like, subscribe, ring that notification bell so you don't miss his new content. Um, weird Realities. So that is a Nightcaller's production. They cover all the weird. So science, myth, folklore, uh, they cover some great topics, you guys. I learn something new every time I listen to that show. So make sure you go check them out. Like, subscribe, comment. Beaver Hook Productions, that's with Logan Craft. Almost a Croft. That's his alter ego. Anyways, you guys go check him out because he produces my videos for Night Terrors and other things. And he's just talented, you guys. Talented videographer. And last but not least, go check out Bigfoot Club with Bob Dominguez and his crew uh they have great guests on as well you guys like subscribe support them again thank you all for coming out tonight thank you for your support and if you're interested in becoming a night callers affiliate where basically uh you help me promote you promote me promote you promote you you know so i'm helping you guys help me help you um you can check out my website at nightcallersproductions.com and you can see what it's all about like I mentioned before, all of my projects are on there, all of the podcasts that I'm a part of, as well as the Boggy Creek Falk Monster merchandise that I manage now. So you guys go check that out. That's all I have for you tonight. Stay safe, be kind, and I 